Good morning. This is Easter morning and we celebrate the fact that Christ is risen and we're really glad that you're able to join us for our pre-recorded worship service. Before we get started, a few announcements. Those of you with small children at home who we normally deal with through the congregation here, you, you should have received some uh, children's packets that in, contain some sidewalk chalk and some games and, and kites. Uh, I know it's in theory supposed to be a little snowy here on, on Easter morning, but the idea is number one, the kids are co cooped up and sooner or later you can throw them outside and they can fly a kite. And uh, uh, we're hoping just the activity of that will, will be a relief. So uh, we pray you can enjoy that very much. I was helping to pre-record the Monday Thursday segment of our worship services this past Tuesday and I was dealing with how come I feel like I'm a deer in the headlights the minute the camera turns on and we feel funny and it occurred to me that the reason that happens is all of the normal rituals that I have on a normal Sunday morning were gone. Normally, I do the same things every Sunday morning. I wake up, I feed the horses, I give the dog his rimadil, I drive into town, I get my things ready, I, I brush my teeth, I greet a few people, and all of those things have a way of, of preparing me and preparing us to be a community that worships together, and we don't have that. So to uh, paraphrase that great theologian, Walt Disney, I lost my groove. So I pray that we can get over that and uh, make this work as we move on into the future. From here on out, the Holy Week services are done and we will be having our normally recorded worship service available to you on Sunday mornings. We are really grateful for the comments that we have received for those who have participated in the Holy Week worship. We pray you're well. And uh, again, I would remind you, if there is some challenge that you are dealing with that we can be helpful with, please let us know. We have a number of resources available and it's just really, it's really a pleasure to be able to be a part of so many people helping other people, even if all we do is connect one person with a resource they need. So, so keep that in mind. At this time, we're going to begin our worship, and unlike the uh, previous recordings we've done, we're going to add a few more of the more traditional worship details. So we are going to call ourselves to worship using a responsive call to worship. So I will be leading, reading the lighter type print. If you in your home would join in reading the darker print, we will call ourselves to worship on this beautiful Easter morning. This is a great and joyous festal day. Come to celebrate amazing good news. We gather for worship in awe and wonder. The tomb is empty. Death is not the last word. Sing songs of praise for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God has answered our prayers with salvation. Jesus Christ is alive, and we too shall live. Open your hearts and minds to the risen Christ. You are greeted by name and welcomed here. This is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Really? 
It's typical in our worship to include a time of confession. Not so that people feel beat up, not so that people feel guilty, but so that people can recognize those things in their lives that have separated them from experiencing the presence of God. And upon recognizing those things, so that they can be clearly forgiven and so that they can move on to the new life that we are intended to have in Jesus Christ. So would you please join me with the unison prayer of confession, which will be projected on your screens. O oh God, the message of Easter has come again before we were ready to receive it. The Palm Sunday parade demanded very little of us. We could join in the hosannas, but the betrayal and denial the suffering and shame, the agony and death have left us fearful and shaken. We have become enemies of Jesus without intending to be disloyal. We have left him in the tomb lest he upset our daily lives. The Jesus of long ago seems more comfortable to us than the Christ who is risen today in our midst. We confess our reluctance to let Christ claim us and change us. O oh God, we need forgiveness. Amen. Please take a few moments now for silent and personal confession before God.
Amen. In the Holy Week readings, there comes a period of time in one of the Gospels when late on the night of Monday, Thursday, Jesus prays for and with the disciples. And he points out that many would suggest that he would help them to avoid this difficult time that they're facing. But he suggests something very different. He suggests that God's Spirit would come upon them and strengthen them and equip them so that they would be encouraged and able to endure whatever comes their way. And that is God's prayer for us as well. The gospel message is not one that is meant to help us avoid life's challenges. And it's not one that's meant to make us feel guilty for those times we fail in life's challenges. It is meant to bring us new life, to forgive us when we fail, and to show us a better way, to equip us for all of life's challenges. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please join together in the glory of Patre as it's projected on our screens. The gospel lesson that we're going to read as our primary lesson for today comes from Luke chapter 24, beginning with the first verse. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices that they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. That ends our gospel reading for this morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we prepare to ponder the mystery of the empty tomb, empty us, and in particular, empty me. Empty us of all vanity and pride. Empty us of all illusions. And make us hollow vessels. Open for your spirit and your word and your truth to be poured in. That as such, we might have a more clear sense of your hand in our lives. And we might have a more clear ability to follow your way as we go in the world. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Each of the four gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus contain slight variations of just what happened on that first Easter morning. In Matthew's gospel, two different women go to the tomb to uh, discover that it is empty. Apparently, they are both named Mary. So the scripture reads that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary go to the tomb. How would you like to be known in history as the other Mary? But the two ladies go to the tomb. They encounter an angelic messenger who is described as lightning with clothes as white as snow. And the angel is so imposing 
that his very appearance causes the, the soldiers guarding the tomb to appear as if they are dead. And the angel tells the woman to take a quick look, verify that the tomb is empty, and then hurry back and tell the disciples that Jesus has risen from the dead. In Mark, the empty tomb is discovered by three women instead of two, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and a woman named Salome. When they arrived at the tomb, they find the tomb empty, and they encounter a polite young man in a very white robe who tells them not to be alarmed but that Jesus has risen from the dead. He tells them to look, see for themselves that he is gone and then go tell the disciples. In Luke's gospel, we hear that some women go to the tomb. They find the stone rolled away. They find the tomb empty. And while they are studying this odd development, they encounter two men in clothes that gleam like lightning and the report that Jesus has risen from the dead and that they should go tell the disciples. And in John's gospel, it is Mary Magdalene alone who goes to the tomb, finds the stone removed, and she runs to tell the disciples. And then she follows those two disciples back to the tomb to see for themselves. And only as they verify that the tomb is empty does she look in for herself. None of these accounts agree in all the minor details just who and how many women discovered the empty tomb, how many angels were present, which disciples responded, and so forth. However, each account has several things in common. In each case, the empty tomb is first discovered by a woman or women, first thing in the morning, the day after the Sabbath. And in each account, the women are impressed with how clean and bright the angel's clothing is. It's almost like a laundry commercial. And most importantly, in all of the accounts, Jesus is no longer in the tomb. It is empty. For some people, the variation in small details between the different Gospels is a problem. I don't find it to be a problem at all. The First gospel writers did not sit down to write their accounts until probably about 60 years after the events took place. Over that period of time, the stories were repeated over and over by countless people. So I'm sure the stories, you might say, grew in the telling. Likewise, if you're like me, your memory hasn't really improved that much in the last 60 years. Uh, so it's not unusual that each of the disciples recalling the events for the gospel writers might have remembered details differently. So to me, the idea that the gospel accounts of the resurrection vary a bit in the details is to be expected. However, what is important and consistent in each of the versions is that in every case the tomb is empty. Isn't it odd that the most remarkable single trait of the largest religion in the world, the most remarkable trait of the Christian faith across all denominations, is marked by the absence of something? The most visible sign of the resurrection, the most evident sign of new life in Jesus, is an empty space, an empty tomb. And that got me to thinking about the Old Testament. If you will recall in the Old Testament, early on, the people of Israel wanted a place to worship God. All the other religions in the area had images of idols or local gods that they worshipped. And the people who practiced those religions went to specific places to worship what they saw as their gods. But the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob the God of the Old Testament, the God of the laws and the, the prophets, the God of the Jews and the Exodus, specifically told his followers that it was impossible to have an image of him and that it was impossible to limit him to one geographic location. So they were expressly forbidden from building a temple or a place to worship him or from making any image to represent him. Then when God revealed his laws to Moses in the Ten Commandments, 
And the people wanted a place to keep those commandments as evidence of God's presence with them. They were allowed to build a box, commonly called the Ark of the Covenant, but it had to be portable so that it could travel with them as they moved through the wilderness because God could not be tied to a single place. And still, they were to have no image representing God. In fact, the ark that they did build, the most visual representation of God in the Old Testament that contained the commandments, the way they represented God on the ark was by having on the lid the image of two angels, two cherubim, facing what appears to be between them a vacant space. In theory, they aren't actually facing each other. They're facing the seemingly empty space between them. They're facing the invisible yet real presence of God that neither time nor space can contain and that no image can depict. The presence of God is illustrated by what appears to the casual observer to be vacant space. The ark itself, when they weren't walking around with it, was to be housed in a tent or a tabernacle. And in the tent, there was a separate, apparently vacant space that the people were forbidden to enter called the Holy of Holies. To the naked eye, the Holy of Holies appeared as a vacant space also. In other words, in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, God is most clearly represented by what appears to us to be a vacancy, by what isn't there instead of by what is there. Be it an empty tomb or the non-image of God on top of the ark or an empty space in the tent of meeting, in each case, God is viewed as most present by what is not there. And if you think about it, even the word holy, in part the word holy is defined as that which is totally other than creation. And to us visually, that which is in no part of creation, that which is neither physical nor tangible, that we cannot touch and that we cannot hold in our hands, that we cannot specifically examine, appears to us only as nothing, as vacancy. The problem with contemporary religion is we keep trying to dumb God down to what we can explain, to that which we can imagine or visualize or conceptualize or symbolize or describe or illustrate or touch, or hold in our hands, or better yet, that we can sell and market. Time and time again, God tells his people not to be so narrow in their thinking. No wonder scientific type folks, which, which I love and I'm grateful for, and I like to think to some extent I am one, but all too often we scientific folks have trouble with the concept of God because God gives us nothing to hold on to and study and examine and poke and prod the way we do with anything else we better want to understand. Think of Moses in the Old Testament when he first encounters God in the presence of the burning bush, which, by the way, was out in the middle of nowhere. A big empty space, totally away from all the activity of life as we know it, perfect for social distancing. From the middle of a vast empty space, God directs Moses to go back to Egypt and lead the people of Israel out of captivity. Moses asks God to name himself so that when he goes back to Egypt, he can tell the people of Israel who it is that is sending him. Moses says, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, well, what is his name? Then what shall I say to them? And God refuses to name or describe himself. 
God not only does not give Moses what he is asking for, but God seems downright testy when he tells Moses, I am who I am. You tell those people that I am has sent you. In a world where people seem caught up in all manner of petty superstitions where they would worship anything from a tree to the sun to some little carved or cast image, God says he is none of those things. God says he is the source and the order beyond all that exists. And that no name can begin to describe him. And no image can represent him. And no place can begin to contain him. He simply says, I am who I am. The God of the Bible simply refuses to be bound by our clumsy attempts to define him. And the empty tomb of Jesus demonstrates once again that Jesus is his father's son. For like his father, the divinity of Jesus is best illustrated by what appears to be a vacant space, an empty tomb, not bound by mortality like the rest of us. We do well to ask ourselves once again, just what was God up to in sending Jesus amongst us? In Jesus, the God that cannot be named, the God who cannot be contained by any one time or any one place or any one description or concept, the God who exists outside of and beyond all creation. In Jesus, this God beyond all knowing stoops down to our level and conveys a glimpse of his nature that we can begin to understand. When we look at Jesus' life and death and resurrection, we catch glimpses of the nature of God, the God who transcends life as we know it, but just a glimpse. So when we look at Jesus and what he teaches, what do we see? We see what we see things that our contemporary world does not understand. Contemporary religion keeps trying to personalize Jesus and make him our best buddy. And indeed, he does come to embody the truth of God in ways that we can begin to relate to and begin to grasp. But we so want to see him as our relatable friend that we lose sight of the fact that he is but a glimpse of the vast and unfathomable God who is beyond all creation. To actually see Jesus is to see a glimpse of someone very different than the world around us. So different, in fact, that at first we have trouble understanding what he is driving at. We see values and teachings that are so different, so simple, so otherworldly that they are tough for us to understand. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. By trying to accumulate as much as possible for ourselves, we lose life. But by dying to self and giving of ourselves, we gain life. That makes no sense in our world. The strong and the mighty will be brought down, but the meek and the poor and the lowly will be lifted up. That's not the way our world works. Religious piety and worldly authority and being part of the in crowd does not impress God. Thanksgiving and grace and compassion and personal sacrifice, and serving others, and humility, and simplicity, and allowing space in our lives for God to make himself evident is how we connect with God. The world doesn't think like that. There's a lot more to life than we can hold in our hands or put in the bank. 
beyond the injustice we see in the world around us. There is a God of truth and justice, and in the end, there will be a reckoning in God's truth, and God's justice will prevail. Again, the, the, the meek and the lowly will finally be recognized and lifted up. And the powerful, those who are often abusing power in our culture, will be brought down. Oh yes, and let's not forget the little things like life and death cannot contain him. The best way to encounter this God is first of all, by not trying to dumb him down into whatever we feel we can explain. If you can explain it, it isn't God. To think we can simplify God to the point that we can explain God is to lose sight of the fact that God is beyond us and beyond creation. And that neither you nor I can define who God is or how God works. One of the greatest prayers I have ever heard, and I often pass it along to families when they're facing the most dire of circumstances, when they've lost a child or had a, one of the great reversals of life and it's left them just, just winded and without a breath. That great prayer, we often refer to it as the sailor's prayer, is simply this. Almighty God, help me because I am so small and the ocean is so big. Amen. It's not based on how big and in control we think we are, but on how small and impotent we know we are. Only by acknowledging how not in control we really are, only by recognizing that God is beyond my capacity to describe or control, do I start grappling honestly with who and what God is. The second step to encountering God, what's really timely for us at this moment in human history, becomes humility. Emptying ourselves of all the vain efforts and simplifying our lives and quieting ourselves and distancing ourselves from all distractions and making space for God to enter in to our experience. We best encounter God not by an ever-increasing list of activities or accomplishments or following the step-by-step -step directions of of some self-proclaimed expert and reading my latest 12-step book that you can have for just $29.99. It's not, we don't find God by ever fancier prayers or a bunch of religious talk or by joining every service club in town, not that it's bad to be a part of a service club. But we encounter God not by joining a crowd of cool and hip people successful in the ways of the world dancing around to the latest praise tunes. We encounter God by realizing that we are creation and not the creator. That despite amazing human advancements which make our lives better, there are now and there always will be aspects of life and death and human behavior, like coronavirus, or human depravity, or cancer, or the inclination to be selfish and self-serving, or corporate greed, or political corruption, there will always be things that we will never fully explain, or solve, or stop through human endeavor. No one in their right mind would ever hope to see a pandemic or a natural disaster, or some of the human conflicts we've witnessed over the centuries that would result in suffering or loss of life. But one small benefit in such out-of-control events 
might be that we finally slow down and create a space in our own lives, away from all of the distractions that we allow to dictate our more normal times. And we allow God to enter in. I heard the saddest thing the other day. A friend of mine had a friend on Facebook who posted the comment that if an epidemic on this, on this scale doesn't show you that there is no God, I don't know what will. And I certainly don't claim to speak for that young man. He believes what he believes for his own good reasons. But couldn't a part of his thinking be based on the misguided message about God that people hear so often from the contemporary church in the United States today? We project an image that God is like the great fairy godmother in the sky that grants our wishes if we grovel and voice our petitions correctly. And then if what we want happens, we must have been faithful. And if what we want doesn't come about, we must have failed in some way. Such a fundamental misunderstanding of God, the nature of God would naturally lead one to believe that God is capricious and petty and mean if he allows a pandemic to take place and a large number of people to die. But my friends, each one of us, we are creation, not the creator. We are each going to die. And sadly, many will die in sad ways before what we think is their time. Because of some aspect of human brokenness, uh, because a pandemic has simply brought death before their time, for all manner of reasons. Remember how we started the season of Lent on Ash Wednesday, before the pandemic was even on people's radar. From the dust you were formed, and to the dust you shall return. In reality, each one of us is creation. Each one of us has a finite number of days. And whether those days end by pandemic or a car accident, or in the depths of poverty in some slum in Calcutta, or through the natural decline of a long-lived life. Each one of us is dust, and in the end, to the dust we shall return. Only God is creator, holy and other and beyond creation. But no tent could hold him, no image could represent him, no rock-cut tomb or grave could contain him. He most commonly reveals himself in empty spaces. And he is most commonly encountered by us when we have allowed enough empty space in our lives for him to enter in. And if you have an empty space in your life, even if it is the result of self-isolation or some great sorrow or tragedy, Sit quietly and wait on him and look for him there and you will find him. For the same God who raised Jesus from the dead promises to walk through the ups and the downs of these lives with us, being undeniably present to any who will create space enough for him to enter in. For us, an empty space, even if it comes at the worst possible time, for us, an empty space is a very, very good thing. Because it's in that empty space that God can be found to be most evident. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, creator of all that is good and source of all good things. Strike down our arrogance and vanity so that in humility we might see you and welcome you into our lives. We pray today for all who are struggling 
for all who are caught up in the challenges of life. We pray for those suffering from illness, disease, or injury of the mind, the body, or the soul. We pray for healing and comfort. And when needed, we pray for acceptance of events that are not of our own choosing. For those striving to provide physical care for others, we seek compassion and patience and strength. We pray for wisdom and for the realization that you are the source of all healing and all good health. We pray for those who have been cooped up too long, that they might make time in their idleness for your good presence to be revealed and to grow more deeply in their lives. Help each of us to ponder the beauty found in the smallest aspects of creation. Help each one of us to appreciate the tiny things, the tiny things that often go unnoticed. We pray that we would appreciate the working of the most everyday bodily functions, that we would appreciate the simplest relationships, that we would appreciate the simple beauty we can look out our window and see, the things that are beautiful not because the human hand has touched them, but because your hand has touched them. We pray for those facing economic uncertainty at this time. We pray that they might have what they need to survive and that we might discover in this time of scarcity for many what truly is of value. We pray for workers in all fields. We pray that we might find meaning in our work and that we appreciate the jobs we have and have had, that we, that we connect in our minds the value of good labor and value the work of our hands. We pray for any who might be feeling isolated or depressed. We pray for encouragement and support. And we pray for the courage to invite others into their lives, even if it's just by email or over the phone, so that they, so that they aren't alone and isolated in their discouragement. Help us to pray for one another and help us to, to be mindful of one another and give us the insights we need for that person who needs a little extra time or a little extra word. And we pray for all of us who, who are aging, for those times when our joints don't work like they used to, for our minds when they're not as sharp as they used to be, when our balance deserts us at the most inopportune times and our heartbeats at times grow weaker. We pray for perspective and patience and encouragement, not just that we would be encouraged, but we would encourage those around us. We pray for those who are grieving. We pray for comfort and awareness that, that such are not alone and that the Lord is with them in their grief just as much as he was with Mary and Martha as they grieved the death of Lazarus. We pray for those struggling with addictions and obsessions, for those struggling with mental illness and just unhealthy thoughts. We pray for those who truly are without on an ongoing basis. We pray for those who do not have a safe place to sleep, for those without basic food to eat or clean water to drink on an ongoing basis. We pray for those who live daily without good sanitation, for those who find simple joy elusive, for those who have never learned to to know your abiding presence. We lift all such up and we ask for your grace and your presence. And we ask that if we encounter such people, that we be gracious and that we remember those times when we have been lost and when we have needed guidance. Help us to realize how little we truly need to be content and then guide us in using what we do have in abundance, sharing it with others in your name. We pray that we might recognize how times of solitude and times of decreased activity might create 
a vacancy in our lives that you might enter into and that we might come to know you more richly and more deeply. We pray as many in our world, be it talking people on the TV or politicians or whomever who are in a season of finger pointing and blame right now, we pray that we would not join in, but help us to honor common sense and compassion for others. That in loving our neighbors as much as we love ourselves, in sharing the good things that we have, and in looking out for the welfare of one another, we would see your face and encounter your presence. We pray for leaders at all levels that at this time and in all times, that they might have wisdom and integrity, insight, patience, cooperative spirits and grace, that they might have understanding and endurance and help them to humble themselves and to seek your guidance before circumstances humble them against their will. May each one of us grow more and more to be your people as you call us to be. May we be tireless in our concern for others and generous and creative as we share our many blessings. Pour out your spirit upon us, guide us in your ways, and help us to remember the way you made your, your word come alive among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Help us to look at his teachings and his example as our guide for living. As we pray in his name and we pray together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So God comes to us in our vacant spaces, 
whether we have willingly created them, looking for God to enter in, or whether life has knocked the wind out of us and we feel hollow and empty and cannot speak. As unwelcome as those times are in our lives, those are still times when God might most clearly enter in. So don't fight that. Don't feel like it's wrong to have such times and such experiences because that is when some people most clearly encounter God for the first time. But we are an Easter people. We are a people whose lives are defined by an empty tomb, by a possibility for life that goes even beyond our own deaths. As you go throughout your routines, I was going to say as you go out into the world, but you're not supposed to, but as you go throughout your routines, as you go to work, as you deal with your family, as you seek to fill your time by going for a hike or getting outside, wherever you go, take with you that presence of God. Take with you the love of God that surpasses all understanding. Take with you the grace of God that we know most clearly in the living person of Jesus Christ. Take with you the hope and the joy and the fellowship and the encouragement that we most experience through the Holy Spirit. And then whatever you do, whether it be in solitude or whether it be in combination with other people, sharing that, that love and that grace and that experience of the Spirit, others might find in you just an inkling of the presence of God that they hunger for in their empty places. Go in peace. Amen.